So we're taking a look today at Netcat bind shells versus reverse shells and uh, really explaining how um, Netcat and SoCat kind of differ. Uh, big shout out, by the way, to uh, Black Omega for the video suggestion and a few other suggestions he made as well. Always awesome to hear um, what you guys want to see. Uh, some of my favorite content to make, quite honestly. So big shout out to him for the suggestion here. Now, Black Omega is probably aware of this, but um, at least for everyone else, I want to very early on in the video clarify that Netcat and SoCat are completely different tools for completely different purposes. Um, both of them are very robust, meaning they can do a lot of different things, um, but they're not really related too much, I wouldn't say. Um, but in this video, we're going to focus on Netcat, and we're going to cover SoCat uh, in possibly the next video that you might see on this channel. So starting with Netcat, right? Um, Netcat is, like I said, it's a Swiss army knife of a tool. It can do a lot of things, but mostly how are you going to be using it as a pen tester is probably what you're most interested in, right? Uh, well, for us, we're normally going to use this to catch reverse shells, um, primarily. So reverse shells or bind shells, um, it's kind of preference, uh, I will say from a security standpoint, um, reverse shells are normally preferable uh, just because um, if you do a bind shell, then anyone can access it versus a reverse shell, it's going to connect to your machine. But there are spe special cases where you know a bind shell might be preferable. Now, let's first explain, you know, i kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit. Let's explain what each one is, what are the differences, and I'll even show you um, by running some commands, how it actually looks and how it actually um, behaves, right? So what I will say is that, first of all, let's start with bind shell. It's probably the simplest of the two to understand. A bind shell is basically you're, you're binding the shell to a port. So if I look at the ports that I am listening on right now, um, you can take a look, right? So right now this machine is just listening on a handful of ports. When you see stuff like uh, the zeros or this, it's like um, all interfaces. Like um, these are like uh, listening on all interfaces here. Uh, and this one is only listening on local hosts. So meaning only my system will be able to see this ports open and connect with it, interact with it, all that, right? Versus something like this where any machine on my network can interface with this port. So a bind shell, you'll typically be binding to all interfaces, of course, so you can then connect to that port and get the shell. So for example, if I create a bind shell, um, let's say, and there's a bunch of different ways to do this. We could use um, MSF Venom to generate a bind shell. That's probably how you're most familiar with it as well. What I can do if I want to create this bind shell with Netcat is I should be able to do netcat-e bin bash and uh, tell it to listen on a port. Um, port 9001 is what we'll go with. And uh, doing that, now we see it's listening on all interfaces, port 9001. And we can even confirm this, right? If we then do the netstat command and uh, we see here, that we are listening on 9001. So let's try to then connect to that port. So we'll use netcat to do that. So netcat, um, we can connect with, um, let me just think about this uh, for a second here. Yeah, just give the IP address. So we could probably just specify the local host in this case. In a real scenario, we would do the, um, the uh, routable IP address, so the IP address of the box, right? And then the port, so 9001. And now you see that we have the, the connection here, right? Um, oops. Sorry, not down here, because we're doing this on our own shell, right? So we can see we can run commands. We can do whatever command we want, right? Um, I basically have a shell here. I can upgrade this, of course, right? Which Python 3, make sure it has it. 
course it does. And Python 3, you know, we can upgrade the shell here. I'm just showing you PTY, PTY.spawn, uh, bin bash. So something like this. Now we have like a, well, you even have the ZSH shell, right? You can't even tell in this case because um, I'm running ZSH on here. So um, yeah, there you go. So you can do other upgrades on the shell, of course, right? Like the STTY raw minus echo and all that. But if you're new and you don't know what I'm talking about, <laughs> don't worry about any of that. That's just like some bonus stuff. But you get the, the main idea here, right? Um, I can open that port. Now, if I close this out, we should see that it's it's cleaned up here. We don't see the port listening anymore. But yeah, this is our bind shell. In this example, right, I used uh, netcat to create a bind shell just like this. And I can give it any port, right, 9002. Run this command again. Now we see we're listening on 9002. We could connect in the same way, get a shell. Other way we could do this, right, is if we use MSF Venom to generate a payload, um, then we can uh, create a bind shell, right? Because in this case, I already have access, shell access to the system, so I'm just demonstrating it using netcat. Um, but if I didn't, obviously, I could generate a, um, like say I had a command injection, right? I could create an exploit script that would start it, or I could even generate it with MSF Venom and then run it, right? So for MSF Venom, if you're aware, one of the things you, you choose is your payload, right? I'll close out of this so it's less cluttered. But uh, yeah, one of the things you choose is your payload. So if we do um, list payloads, and I'm just going to filter for uh, the Linux payloads because there's a ton. There will there'll still be a ton, honestly, but it will narrow it down quite a bit for us. If you look at the payloads here, the ones you're probably used to using, I would say, most likely, is you're probably used to using something like uh, the reverse TCP ones, right? So maybe Meterpreter, reverse TCP, or um, just the regular shell reverse TCP. Here's the 64-bit versions of those. Um, this is probably one you're familiar with. Um, and even the, the, I believe the non-stage one, this one, this is probably one I use, um, one of the most I would say, but if you want to do the bind shell, all you need to do is choose, um, one that has bind in the name, right? So like, um, interpreter bind TCP, or without that, you could do the shell bind TCP, right? Right here. And uh, what that will do is create the bind shell on whatever port you want. And then the next step is to do like I did earlier and connect to it using netcat, right? So IP address and port. And upon connecting to it, you'll have the shell. So obviously the security implication of this is any attacker or like any other external person that knows that uh, the port is listening there and you can get a shell just by connecting to it, they're able to connect to it as well. Now, there are certain utilities you can use to lock it down, I do believe. I haven't used those personally because I normally just use the uh, reverse shell. Uh, the reverse shell can also be a lot more stealthy, right? Obviously, if you're opening up a port on the box, that's a lot more noisy. So also for that reason, in a real world scenario, you'll typically see uh, the reverse shell happening because especially if you run it on a port that they would commonly expect traffic on, like say port 443, maybe even 80 or something like that, um, it's easier to blend in with the normal traffic. If stealth is of concern at all to you whatsoever, then that would be the way to go, the reverse shell. Now the reverse shell, right? We explain the bind shell. Now let's cover what is the reverse shell. So obviously on the bind shell scenario, we're binding the shell to the actual server. In the case of the reverse shell, we're actually, for all intents and purposes, opening a port on our box. We're listening on, on a port, right? And the payload that we're supplying to the target server is saying, hey, connect to our server on this port. So all the server is gonna be doing is making a request on, you know, to your server and your, pro, uh, your port that you told it to use, and it's connecting back with the shell. So 
that's why it's called a reverse shell. The shell is um, it's like a reverse TCP connection from the the target server back to your machine. So that's how it differs. Um, so we can do that as well. I'll show you a little demonstration of that case as well. So we will say like on our system here, we'll say that, um, you know what? We'll use it to not confuse you guys. We we'll use the same scenario. Up here is the target machine. Down here, we'll assume this is our local box. Now, for this example, it's both my local box, but let's just imagine that this is our target up here, and this is our attacker machine down here. So the first thing we'll do is on our attacker machine, we'll use netcat to listen on a particular port. We'll use 9001 just to keep it consistent. So now we're listening for any connections on that port. So now through a payload or some kind of exploit or anything like that, however you're able to run code uh, on the target system because that is the prerequisite for this. Maybe it's even through social engineering, um, running your malicious binary. Um, you got a user to click on, or, you know, to you know, plug in the USB or whatever the case may be, right? Or an exploit, uh, exploiting a vulnerability with code execution, whatever the case may be, you have the ability to run code on the target system you're going to need to have that code in whatever language or bash or, or PHP or whatever it is. You're going to have to have code that tells the target server to spawn a shell and with that shell connect to your IP in this port 9001. So to simulate that, I'm going to be typing a netcat command. But remember, this can be done um, with like uh, many different programming, like, like any programming language, any depends on what technology is being used, what you're exploiting or anything like that, right? So I could do something like this and connect to my server and my port. So now I do that and I get the connect back and now I can run commands, right? And of course I could upgrade the shell uh, just as I did before. Maybe I'll show that real quick. So, because right now we don't really have a prompt, right? Um, so we can get the prompt, pty.spawn bin bash. And this is just one of those commands you run so many times to the point that you just memorize it out of necessity, kind of. But yeah, see, I can run stuff and see my output and all that. Perfect, right? So this was the example of a reverse shell, how it differs from the bind shell. Um... Typically, I just use reverse shells unless I'm faced with a scenario where I have to use a bind shell, uh, just personally. Uh, I, I think a lot of attackers probably follow that same kind of methodology. So, um, yeah, hopefully that helped clear it up for you. Um, and uh, let me know if there's any questions, as always, down in the comment section below. And uh, go ahead and check out the videos on screen if you're eager to get into some more content. Just keeping on this stuff consistently is the best way to learn, as well as putting in the, the practice, for sure. So I'll see you guys right over in those videos. Thanks for watching.